So is this the moment? Will there be action to address women's economic inequality in this budget? Well, I think uh, you saw in October the fact that we responded with some investments in childcare, in PPL, in paid domestic and family violence leave, in the respect at work recommendations. So I think that set the signal that we are deadly serious about addressing women's inequality across the economy, uh, but across the community more broadly. Um, the Women's Economic Equality Task Force, with Sam as the leader of that task force, has provided us with a letter outlining some of those initial priorities. They'll provide us with a report uh, in the next month or so, which finalises their work. But yeah, we're deadly serious about doing something and you know we are going to take steps in every budget that we're in government to address inequality across the economy. Well, let's look at some of those steps and some of the recommendations that that task force has made in this letter that you referenced there. Number one, their number one priority for this budget, they say, needs to be the single parent parenting payment uh, for, at the moment for women, once their youngest child turns eight, they lose the payment. Do you agree that the bills don't stop for a single mum or a single dad uh, when their youngest turns eight? Well, of course they don't stop when they turn eight. Um, the arrangements at the moment are that you move on to the job seeker payment. And lose about $100 um, a week? And this, is, and this is the issue that's been raised by the Women's Economic Equality Task Force and others. Uh, and we're having a look at it. Um, you know, we don't set up these task forces to then um, not seriously consider the recommendations that they come forward with. Um, the budget will look to do as much as it can uh, within, you know, the responsible fiscal environment that we are in uh, to deal with addressing disadvantage and inequality where we can. I understand the Expenditure Review Committee is looking at lifting that cut-off age to 12. Um, do the bills get any cheaper once the, the child starts high school? You don't want high school kids starting off in poverty, do you? Well, again, we're looking at the recommendations from the Women's Economic Equality Task Force. I'm, I'm a member of the ERC, but I don't disclose what goes on in the ERC. Um, we are looking at the recommendations and, you know, you'll see some of those outcomes in the budget. Is it fair to say that you, Katie Gallagher, in that ERC are pushing pretty hard to lift it right back up to the age of 16 where it used to be? Well, as I just said, I don't talk about uh, the ERC or what uh, my views or any other member of the ERC's views is. You know, it's a responsible government. We get these reports. It's a collegiate approach across the ERC. We have feedback, of course, from our caucus colleagues as well. Um, these issues, aren't, uh, you know, they're being raised with everybody. Mm. Um, you know, not just those members of the ERC, and we, we're seriously looking at it. We want to ensure that within the environment we're in, you know, where we've got a range of pressures coming at us and those pressures are increasing over the longer term, not decreasing, that we're doing what we can to address women's equality but also address disadvantage and poverty where we can. Well, women over the age of 55 are now the cohort most at risk of homelessness. Uh, both of the expert panels you've uh, commissioned and now received uh, have said the Commonwealth rent assistance must be urgently increased as well. Do you agree that soaring rents have left a lot of women in an increasingly vulnerable situation? Well, I think uh, absolutely you're right that the age group that you refer to, older women, um, women without super, I mean, this is the issue more broadly and it can't be solved in one budget or in actually in one parliament and the Women's Economic Equality Task Force makes this point. Um, you know, we. We earn less, we retire with less, uh, we have less assets, less wealth, we earn um, less in lower paid jobs. Um, these, uh, this is the reality of 2023 for Australia's women. And um, this is the work that we have started in the budget. It's the work we're going to continue in this budget and we'll continue focusing on it. And housing for women and providing some security of housing for women, particularly women in that age cohort that you referred, uh, is a real challenge uh, and that's why we've got initiatives like our Housing Australia Future Fund and some of the other measures that the Treasurer is working on with the Housing Accord to look at how we can push and increase the amount of social and affordable housing, particularly for demographic age groups like this. But in, in terms of the rent assistance, it does sound to me like you are hinting this morning that there will be some movement in the budget on that Commonwealth rent assistance. Well, I'm saying in, in general, we are serious about looking at what we can do around housing. I am saying in terms of the recommendations from the Women's Economic Equality Task Force, there were six 
recommendations, of which those, um, you know, parenting payments, single mm -hmm. and Commonwealth rent assistance were two. We are looking at those uh, in the through the ERC process. Haven't concluded a view, and will people will see the results of that on budget night? All right. So, uh, what about job seeker? Let me ask you about that. You, in opposition, urged the Morrison government to be compassionate to ensure people could live a dignified life. Do you think those on job seeker are currently living a dignified life? Well, there's certainly, um, you know, pre you know, in terms of job seeker, there's no doubt that people on job seeker. Uh, do it tough. There's no doubt about that. Are living a dignified um, life, to use your words? Uh, well, I mean, it's hard for me to pass a judgment on that. Like, for, for some, you know, I'm not going to say they'd live an undignified life. I am saying that there's certainly um, pressure and, you know, it's, it's hard to live on job seeker. I accept that. The challenge for government, and, you know, I note some on the couch. Um, you know, don't see this as a real issue, is how we balance up the range of pressures um, across the budget, and they're, you know, they're substantial and they're across mm. almost every area, in a budget that's been booby-trapped in all of those issues that we've inherited, a trillion dollars of debt, how do we balance up the, all of the need and, and you know, finalise those well, let's decisions? Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that, Minister, because I think the government did cost this week uh, what, it would, what it would cost to do all of these things, including the, the job seeker increase that's recommended and said it would be, what, $34 billion over the next four years? Is that right? I think it's in the order, yeah, between $25 and $30 billion across, across those recommendations from the Economic, right. uh, Advisory Com Economic Inclusion Advisory Committee. OK, $25 to $34 billion. What's the cost of the Stage 3 tax cuts over the next four years? Well, those will be updated in the budget, but, you know, they're... I, I can't recall what they are across the Ford estimates. It was, but nearly, 41, you know, it was nearly $41 billion, according to the Treasurer, in October, so it's presumably more than that now. Well, they'll be updated in the budget, David. So it's costing more to do the Stage 3 tax cuts than to implement well, all stage, of these things? The Stage 3 ta tax cuts are legislated. They're due to come in in July next year. Um, you know, we haven't changed our position on those. And the challenge for us is looking across the budget as a whole, where we can uh, make additional spending, where we can make additional savings and how we make those decisions. And it's a balancing act. There's no doubt about it. We have to balance all of these different pressures, whether it's defence, health, you know, all the investments in Medicare that have a cost of living focus, mm. how we balance all of those, those, those tax and cuts conclude fit those the balance? decisions. That's, those tax cuts are the right balance? Well, we haven't changed our position no, on them, the David. Right, are they the right balance? Well, our, our position is those tax cuts are legislated and we haven't changed our position. Right. My job as Finance Minister is to look, ensure quality spending to make some of those t dis difficult decisions. And there are difficult decisions. I don't want to pretend to anybody that these are easy decisions. They mm. are difficult. Uh, but how do we get that balance right? How do we address disadvantage? How do we support those that are mo most vulnerable? How do we provide cost of living relief? Uh, within the context of the environment we're in. Now, the budget's going to get, um, you know, be improved in the short term. We'll see um, improvement in the budget numbers in the short term. But the longer term pressures on the budget are increasing and mm. we have to focus on that as well. So, will the, this budget include any new taxes or tax increases? Uh, well, you'll see uh, the results of that on budget night. I'm not here to... Um, to hand the budget down uh, earlier than uh, the 9th of May. All right. uh, but, but there might be you, new taxes. Well, well, you'll know we've been clear uh, that we've got our focus on multinational tax reform, our modest changes to high balance super accounts. Um, so, you know, in, in that sense, the answer to your question is yes. You, you will see those reflected in the budget. And the petroleum uh, resource rent tax too? Well, we've received the advice from Treasury. We haven't formed a, a concluded view on that. Um, uh, you know, that was work commissioned by the former government. Uh, it's been going for the last few years. Uh, and, you know, Treasury's view is that uh, they think that there are improvements that could be made to the PRRT. Uh, we're considering those. We haven't formed a view about it, whether it's this budget or this year. Uh, I think the industry sort of are well across what those um, modest changes might be because they've been involved in those mm. consultations. Uh, but we haven't finalised a view on that, David. Yeah, I mean, the industry's pointing out how much tax they currently pay. They, they point out that it's going up. Uh, well, their forecast is that it will go up 
next financial year considerably, although they haven't said notably how much they're now forecasting their profits uh, to go up next financial year. Are they paying enough tax, the, the gas producers? Well, in terms of the PRRT, um, you know, we haven't finalised a view on that, but I think from our point of view, we want to make sure that, mm. you know, taxpayers are getting the right sort of return through that uh, measure. Uh, and, you know, that's the work that Treasury's done. They think there are um, some changes that could be made. There are a number of different um, recommendations or views put through that and we'll, we'll conclude our discussions on that in the short term. Will there be new savings found in this budget? Uh, yes, we are looking at savings all the time. I mean, this is something that we started in October where we had that considerable uh, savings and reprioritisation exercise and yes I mean the reality is we have to find savings as well um, and it's not just savings to return to budget it's actually finding those savings that can be reprioritised into mm. areas of new need um, that's part of the challenge as well but you know we've we, we've inherited a budget that's under a lot of stress we've got a lot of booby traps we've got a lot of terminating measures where you know for example the digital health agency just loses funding on the 30th of June this year. I mean, seriously, uh, that, that agency presumably needs to keep going. Same with the eSafety Commissioner in some of the uh, funding that that agency has. No, so we're actually having to deal with that and you'll see a reasonable mm. part of the budget is actually addressing these terminating measures, which is essentially the dishonesty of the previous government about the state the budget was in. And when you talk about finding savings and reprioritising that, what about the NDIS? Are we going to see much in this budget in terms of the, the reboot that Bill Shorten's talking about? Well, yeah, Bill outlined some of that at the press club earlier this week. I mean, I, I think the uh, challenge in the NDIS is actually about making sure that every dollar going in there, um, and it's a substantial amount of dollars now, is actually delivering the outcomes we want in supporting people with a disability to live a dignified life um, and you know so some of that might might involve changes within the scheme but that's you know that he, he went through those at the press club about how we're trying to make sure you know things like fraud uh, making sure that those dollars are not being um, spent other than for the purpose for which they were intended. Finally on the Reserve Bank uh, Minister the review panel the review into the Reserve Bank called for more monetary policy expertise uh, around the, the board a new monetary policy uh, board indeed. The government made two new appointments to the existing board uh, on Thursday. Do either of them have monetary policy expertise? David, those two appointments are first-rate candidates for a start. Um, we went through an expression of interest process. Uh, the Governor and Treasury were involved in that. That's the first time that's happened. And I note the Governor in his press conference welcomed those appointments to the board. Uh, from our point of view, Apart from them but having incredible careers of substance, both of those appointees, um, we absolutely think that people with experience about uh, working people's lives and about wages um, and wages role in the economy absolutely uh, is important to have reflected on the board. Yeah, but the, the, um, the review is quite specific about the need for monetary policy expertise, right, to push back at the, yeah. the governor and so on at board meetings. Do either of these two new appointments have monetary policy expertise? Well, absolutely. We think that those, the credentials they bring, both from corporate Australia and from, say, the Fair Work Commission, uh, those views and perspectives and their lengthy and highly distinguished careers absolutely have a role in monetary policy decisions and that they're first-rate appointees and we're really pleased that they've taken up the opportunity. All right, Finance Minister Katie Gallagher, we'll leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thanks very much, David.